Wow. Your colophons, every one that you have submitted, they are all marvelous. It is such a pleasure to read them. Here's a visualization of me when I read them. <laughs> this is what I did inside, okay? I want to kind of reflect on the nature of your achievement. I'll only go over two in detail because I want to be concise, but really these are themes that I'm finding throughout them. So if we look at Carolyn's group, Carolyn, Jade, Paige, and Leslie, I noticed how much deep thinking and careful research was combined with imagination. So you hear it in the first lines. They've addressed their colophon to fellow monastics which is a great thing to do. Who is the community that's going to receive this artwork? Who is the expected audience? That's always a key question for us as art historians. And they say in their address, in a time of such chaos, stress, and in the face of the unknown. So right away, I thought, oh my God, it's the pandemic. There, It's COVID. COVID is in medieval Europe. No, um, it's not COVID, but they're also dealing with chaos, stress, and the face of the unknown. And I thought it was very powerful that they start with the emotional state that motivates the manuscript, right? Always we're thinking, what are the intentions? What are the motivating desires? And they give us that right away in a very powerful direct language. And they also are very direct and complete about identifying the object itself. The woman clothed with the sun and it's reflecting the apocalypse and they explain that it's a collection of Beatus' manuscripts and they give you this, the actual biblical text. This is actually very impeccable art historical scholarship. One of the things we need to do in art history is to always identify the art object we are examining as concretely and comprehensively as we can. And they did that beautifully. So their next paragraph then goes into really deep, close reading is the term we use of the artwork, meaning examining the artwork as carefully, as microscopically as you can to to tease out all of the aspects that are significant. And this is something that Karen praised them for, that they had such descriptive and vivid details. And so I wanted to also comment on how helpful and generous these responses were to your peers, letting you, reminding you of the power of description as part of analysis and the importance of the vivid details. And we see that when they say spanning two entire pages. Notice that close description, one of the things it does is it helps the viewer to notice more, to think more about what they're actually seeing. Look, you are seeing a manuscript illustration that actually spans two entire pages. So it's given this pride of place, this expansive quality that fits the subject matter. The focus point is the seven-headed dragon, meant to be a symbol of nearing doom and despair. This anxiety and blatant fear are displayed in the bug-eyed abstract dis dis excuse me, depictions of the faces of the angels and women. Excellent move here to be tying a detail, bug-eyed abstract de depictions, to what that signifies making the implicit explicit. Well, that's because there's anxiety and blatant fear just pulsating through this scene of cosmic terror. And I also wanted to commend them for having a real sense of structure to their colophon, a paragraph one, a second paragraph, a third, and each one of them doing something specific. That's something I constantly want to be training students to do because many times students, they have good ideas, but they're not gelling and they're not um, being presented well because they're just a long glob of undifferentiated text. They make clear breaks and leave white space so that you can shift to a new thought and they shift into here the physical details of the process of making. And I remember in our earlier Q&A discussion on formal analysis, some students were asking, well, what exactly is physical, the physical analysis part of art historical interpretation? Well, this is a brilliant example, dealing with all of the physical elements that include the materials as well as how they were produced. So the techniques and the materials, we will find over and over again that they are part of the meaning. 
Karen, Sierra, and Anya's colophon is also a marvel of both imaginative time travel, if you will, which is what history wants to do. It wants to travel back in time to understand the past from the perspective of the people who lived there then. So it's a, it is this marvel of imaginative time travel, but it is also impeccable scholarly precision. And that's what makes these colophons so exciting. And you see that, you feel that right away in the first line where the language itself captures both the feeling of the past of the medieval world and the kind of the worldview of people whose identity is devoted, is built around religious devotion. I hereby share my greatest work for all inspiring posterity. Pray these gospels will be embedded in the hearts and memories of many for eternity. Right, that's wonderful because it's creative writing. But it's also creative writing that gives us an exceptionally strong insight into why Bishop Aidfrith at Linda's Farn Monastery was willing to take approximately 10 years to create the 516 pages fashioned with vellum from 150 calfskins. What a great use of statistics. Um, this is such a brilliant way of, of being very scholarly and specific about this thing called the Linda's Farm Gospels and giving us a tremendous sense of what incredible devotion and labor went into it, as well as the sacrifice of some innocent little animals. So notice how in just a few sentences, their initial sentences, this team has given us a, a sense that we are looking into a complete world, an imaginative world. This is what fiction writing does, yet it is also utterly convincing and factual as an expression of the medieval mind. And of course, I have to mention the pièce de résistance, that's French for the ultimate, the ultimate achievement, signing Bishop Aidfrith's colophon with this signature address, Solidaire Gloria, glory to God alone. If you Google that, you will um, find many, many hits. But one of the most interesting is that the great composer Johann Sebastian Bach, J.S. Bach, wrote those initials on his remarkable compositions, saying, this is not my glory, it's God's glory. And that's exactly what Bishop Edfrith says here. So I am so just in awe and delighted that all of these, I don't have time to talk about all of them because I don't want you to stop listening to the video, but all of them were really beautifully written and deeply researched. And that's, you know, those two skills are such critical college skills. Beautifully written and deeply researched is like three quarters of the game and so much of it. Um, so you should be thinking that what you're learning in art history Yes, it's wonderful to learn about art, but you are also learning about modes of thinking, analytic thinking and writing that you want to remember to apply to other classes. And since the achievement was so high here, I want to offer extra credit to, to anyone who de decides to reply to this question. What was it about this assignment, do you think, that led all of you to produce such high quality work?